Um, today I would like to talk to you about uh, the optogenetic functional MRI technology that we've recently developed, uh, which enables genetically targeted systematic brain circuit analysis. Well, as you all know, the brain is a very complex circuit comprising of many billions of neurons, many more times glial cells. It also consists of many different cell types, which makes the task of understanding the brain circuit connection topology and function extremely difficult. Also, in terms of spatial scale, until, unless you go down to nanometer scales, it's very difficult to uh, distinguish any parts of it. And so, as one of the efforts to understand these uh, complex brain circuit, uh, one of the approaches to try and reconstruct the anatomical connection of the brain circuitry, where uh, you can go down to the electron microscopy scale and try to connect, reconstruct each um, uh, synaptic connectivity down to the nanometer scale, or there's also an effort trying to reconstruct the whole brain uh, connection topology in the diffusion tensor MRI scale. However, the brain is a dynamical system which has function that occurs on top of these uh, anatomical connectivity. So ideally to understand this complex dynamic system, what you need to be able to do is to perform circuit analysis where you can provide systematic test inputs to a specifically controlled point within the circuit where you need to be able to temporally and uh, cell type specifically control these control nodes within the brain while monitoring the global network output uh, throughout the whole brain in an intact system. And if you look at what we currently do in terms of our effort to uh, understand its uh, circuit dynamics, some of the efforts include looking at electrophysiology, where uh, you perform this in cell culture, in slice, as well as in vivo, where um, uh, on the other hand, you, there's another approach where you look at functional MRI, where things are completely in vivo. However, some of the limitations of these current approaches include the fact that when you do electrophysiology, mainly the stimulation, when you do in vivo especially, when all the circuits are densely packed together, uh, there's no selectivity in your stimulation in your control aspect of it. You can only select for location where having an electrode select a specific location, uh, you still have the problem of having many different cell types that are intermingled together within that location. And also, in terms of readout, uh, this doesn't allow for the full spatial information to be encoded uh, when you have several electrodes recording for this um, big brain that has uh, many different nodes. And you can't possibly have all the electrodes record from each uh, locations, which will be destructive for the brain. And this destructive nature also makes it difficult to do longitudinal readout across um, time. Uh, making it difficult to study certain aspects of the brain. While functional MRI, on the other hand, is completely in vivo uh, with no uh, invasive uh, nature associated with it, uh, but it also has the problem of being non-selective in terms of its stimulation, where we often use things like sensory stimulation to trigger the brain while looking at things. Um, or even uh, use microelectrode stimulation for animals. Uh, but these are all um, non-selective enough in terms of its uh, cell type specificity and the temporal control aspect of it. On the other hand, there's also the resting state functional MRI approach where you can look at uh, the network um, connectivity uh, throughout the brain, non-invasively, but it also has the problem of being non-causal where it's difficult to interpret the result that comes from it. And less known uh, but is also of significant problem is the low image quality of functional MRI, uh, where it becomes uh, difficult to register some of the spatial anatomical location due to its uh, low quality. And today I'd like to talk to you about how optogenetic functional MRI can potentially provide a solution to these problems. So optogenetic functional MRI is ideally suited for this task of analyzing the brain in a systematic manner for the following reasons. First, you can stimulate specific cell types. You can trigger them and control them with high temporal precision in the millisecond range. 
while monitoring the causal, you know where the cause of this uh, signal disturbance is coming from. You can monitor the, monitor the causal, in vivo, and brain-wide activity responses. And this is a picture of a system uh, where this is an MRI system uh, scanner bore uh, with the animal sitting here with an optical fiber uh, that was implanted into the brain to provide this optical uh, control to the animal. Again, when you do things like microelectrode stimulation, it lacks cell type specificity, where even if you carefully place uh, the microelectrode at a specific location in the brain, it'll have many different cell types, many different excitatory, inhibitory neurons, as well as fibers of passage uh, going through this region, which makes the task of understanding the output of uh, such nonspecific stimulation. You can stimulate these and look at the responses, but it makes it difficult to understand what that means. Whereas optogenetics enables cell type specific temporally precise stimulation where you can selectively express these light sensitive rhodopsins such as channel rhodopsin and halo rhodopsin in genetically targeted cells where you can have only specific cell types to be controllable to either excite or inhibit uh, using these optical means, uh, blue light to excite or yellow light to inhibit. So you can use optical stimulation to activate or silence these genetically targeted neurons, which allows us to have very specific control of selective neural population. The cell type uh, specific expression of these um, channerodopsin and halorodopsin, the optogenetic probes, can be achieved through uh, various means that are developed in the world of genetics where you can use uh, viral, expression system, viral expression systems uh, such as the lentivirus or so deno associated viruses to insert genes to express channel rhodopsin or halo rhodopsin in specific uh, cell types. Uh, throughout the talk, I'm going to show you results from uh, using the adeno associated viruses here, where you could have a promoter uh, to select for cell type uh, use an opsin, either channelrhodopsin or halorhodopsin, and a, a um, fluorescent protein tag to co-localize the expression of uh, these um, proteins. You can also do in utero electroporation to select for different developmental stage of uh, the neurons, or use transgenic mice. There are many different transgenic mice currently developed uh, to selectively express these channelrhodopsin or halorhodopsin under Thai one promoters, and many other promoters uh, are currently available. And you can also use uh, the Cree driver transgenic mouse lines, where you can use it in combination with the Cree dependent AAV vector where uh, the AV vector will allow you to express channelrhodopsin only in uh, Cree-expressing uh, uh, groups of neurons. And so for the first experiment where we conducted this optogenetic fMRI study, uh, we targeted the excitatory neurons uh, using viral injections. And the virus we used was an AAV5 virus uh, with a CAM kinase promoter um, to select for excitatory neurons and channel rhodopsin for excitability with the blue light, and EYFP tag for uh, localizing these channel rhodopsin expressing neurons. And so here, this is an example where this uh, virus was injected into the motor cortex of a rat brain. And you can see uh, a neuron that is expressing um, um, channel rhodopsin uh, with the EYFP tag shown here. Uh, CAM kinase staining shows that it's indeed an excitatory neuron uh, and there's no inhibitory marker shown here. And through these uh, analysis, we have validated that the specificity of uh, this expression is around 99 and sensitivity of around 89% uh, for this system. And also we chose the AAV5 virus in order to make it uh, an anterior grade labeling where at the site of injection, we're going to have expression in the cell body and the processes where when we inject into the motor cortex, we see uh, the cell body uh, expressing uh, channelrhodopsin, whereas in other downstream locations, you can only see the axons expressing from the cells that have projection from this injection site. And here uh, is an example of a thalamus injection where you again see the expression in the cell body in the thalamus while the ex, uh, you see axonal expressions uh, in the other downstream locations from this thalamus. <laughs>
So with this setup, uh, what we first aimed to do was to trigger the excitatory neurons uh, in the motor cortex um, with blue light. Uh, this setup consisted of injecting uh, this virus into the motor cortex. And here with the uh, fluorescence and confocal microscopy, you show this uh, ex vivo validation that indeed these areas expressed uh, channel rhodopsin. And also with a optical fiber coupled with an electrode uh, inside the motor cortex, you can see that the blue light triggers uh, the responses, uh, excitability within this region. And with this setup, we conducted the very first OFMRI experiment where we saw that the excitatory neuron triggering leads to robust bolt signals with classical hemodynamics. And so here, this is a control experiment uh, where we just put the optical fiber in uh, just in case there's any uh, effect from heating, for example. And you can see that without the opsin expression, uh, just triggering of blue light doesn't have any effect on the, uh, on the brain. While having the opsin expression in combination with the light source here, triggering with blue light, we have elicited responses throughout the motor cortex, some in the contralateral cortex, as well as the, as the striatum, as you can see here. And these are a couple slices selected around the site of stimulation uh, in the motor cortex. And this is a, a fMRI hemodynamics showing that these voxels that are expressed here are correlated with the light stimulation source that are repeated uh, throughout the trial. And if you look at the single cycle of the hemodynamic response, you can see that it has a uh, increase uh, as soon as the stimulation turns on with the decay that's starting with the stimulation turning off with the post-stimulus undershoot, which has the classical shape of a uh, functional MRI hemodynamic response, which shows that by selectively triggering the excitatory neurons uh, in the using optogenetics leads to robust, uh, bold fMRI signal with the classical dynamics. Question. Yes? Is the animal anesthetized? These animals are anesthetized with isofluorine. So I don't mean to be obscurantist, but doesn't that mean that the initial state of the animal is more or less irrelevant to what would happen in a behaving animal? That's a good question. Um, there are a lot of in general, uh, that could be said about a lot of neuroscience where you do all kinds of recordings with anesthetics. And so currently in my lab, keeping that in mind, we also do awake animal scanning in order to see, see, first of all, if there's any kind of difference and to also enable some of the behaviors coupled with it. But nonetheless, even in the anesthetic state, state we can discover a lot of interesting things uh, that are relevant. And of course, there are going to be some differences in the brain response uh, when you have anesthetics versus not. Um, but with careful experiment design choices, I think you can still make very good sense of a lot of data like in any other neuroscience experiment setting. Yes. Any other questions? So are there ethical issues in working with uh, awake behaving animals, um, getting a, you know, especially neurons in the In For MRIs? We, we yeah. talk about it later, yeah? No. Um, well, animal protocols <laughs> stand in the way of a lot of this, but this is something that is done very commonly in many labs net right now, the, in terms of eliciting behavior with optogenetic stimulation. And it turns out to be very effective in teasing out very interesting behavior. And so, any other questions? Okay. And so here, we have first shown that, combining with uh, functional MRI readout, we can get this classical dynamics, which is very interesting. But what we truly wanted to do uh, with this experiment, at least on my part uh, as motivation, was to be able to do a global circuit level analysis. And to be able to do that, we need to be assured that we can elicit responses in the long range locations away from the site of stimulation. And when we drive the uh, motor cortex neurons, one of the places where you expect to see some amount of activity resulting from driving this population is the thalamus through the corticothalamic projections. And here uh, you can see, validate the anatomical projections from the motor cortex, since you can see these axonal fibers expressing channel rhodopsin as a result of having uh, channel rhodopsin expressed in these cells with cell body in the motor cortex. 
And while this confirms the anatomical connections, if we drive a subset of these neurons uh, with light, uh, we expect to see some signal here. And luckily, yes, we do see signal in these uh, thalamic regions projecting from the motor cortex very robustly, uh, which is validating that we can indeed use this technique to uh, look at uh, global circuit uh, responses. However, one of the things that we didn't necessarily expect but was uh, surprised to find is that the hemodynamic response in the motor cortex and the thalamus was uh, very distinct, where in the motor cortex you see this immediate rise in signal, uh, whereas in the thalamus you have this delayed responses. And this was very consistently observed for different stimulus durations across many animals. And to see why this was the case, uh, we decided to record both in the uh, motor cortex and the thalamus, um, where we stimulated in the motor cortex while recording at these two sites, which showed that in the motor cortex, there was an immediate increase in the spike rate, which persisted throughout the uh, stimulation duration. Whereas in the thalamus, uh, there was a driven response that had a group delay in terms of its spike rate increase. And you can see that if you plot the number of spikes that occur in a, every three second time bin, which, is, which was the temporal uh, resolution of these fMRI scans, uh, you can see that there is a uh, distinct delay in the spike rate increase in the thalamus. And you can see that this shape more or less resembles what you see in the hemodynamic response function shape, which shows that we can not only pick out all the different regions that are active as a result of these specific optogenetic stimulation, but you can start to also parse out the temporal firing patterns from the hemodynamic response functions. And so, so far, what we have shown with the initial experiments is that you can drive specific types of neurons in uh, specific locations using optogenetics to drive uh, bold signal. You could also see that you could drive it in remote locations, and also, there is uh, some potential of looking at uh, these uh, responses with temporal information. And once we had this, one of the additional features we wanted to see if we can uh, incorporate was the following. Despite the fact that we can target for specific genetic populations, like the excitatory neurons in the motor cortex, it is that population in itself is not necessarily homogeneous, depending on what you're studying. Even all the neurons with excitatory cell bodies in the motor cortex, they can be subgrouped based on which areas the axons project to, for example. The, the neurons that project axons to other parts of the cortex versus thalamus. And it's very unlikely that we'll have genetic means to dissect all of them separately. And so we chose to try out a strategy where we inject the virus into the motor cortex while stimulating at the site of its axonal projection target, which allows us to select four, three different criteria. One, its genetic identity. Two, its cell body location. Three, its axonal projection target location. And so with this very specific groups of neurons, uh, whether we could elicit bold responses to be able to look at its um, circuit response, not necessarily clear, but luckily it works out where uh, when we stimulated these specific uh, group of neurons, we could see responses in various parts of the thalamus as well as back into the, in the M1 cortex, which shows that indeed we can select for these uh, very specific groups of neurons uh, to perform circuit analysis based on these um, more refined uh, set of constraints. And once we had these validated, we wanted to test it in a very simple circuit to see whether we can identify um, um, different circuitry using this OFMRI approach. And so here, what we have done is injected the virus into the thalamus uh, to see if we can map out these very simple uh, distinct circuitry. The thalamosensory cortex connection uh, through the tracer studies uh, in the literature, I could, we could see that they're mainly unilateral, while the thalamomotor cortex connections are bilateral due to its motor coordination needs. And uh, when you stimulate uh, the thal part of the thalamus that projects this, the sensory cortex, we could see this very clearly where the unilateral sensory cortex light up. And um, the value of the study uh, can be highlighted by the fact that 
Uh, at the time when I was doing this ex particular experiment, there was a cover paper published in Neuron where they conduct this same experiment uh, in slices. And in order to do these experiments in slices, you have to have them be sliced exactly where you have to include both these thalamic fibers and uh, the uh, sensory cortex, which in itself is a very difficult uh, experiment to conduct. While these are all in vivo experiments where you can select for different types of neurons in vivo while uh, looking at these uh, responses in um, real time now, where this experiment only takes about uh, 20 minutes to conduct in vivo. And in contrast, when we stimulated uh, the um, thalamomotor projection region, we could see that uh, bilateral structures light up as a result of stimulation here, validating that we could indeed get uh, very good responses um, out of these uh, uh, simple experiments. And so in summary, the uh, in vivo brain circuit analysis using OFMRI, uh, I have shown so far, uh, can be conducted using these two different strategies. First, by injecting these anterior grade viruses into a certain site while stimulating at the same region, you can select for cell types based on cell body location and genetic identity and look at the downstream uh, circuit responses associated with it. While if you inject in a certain location while stimulating at its axonal projection target location, you can select for its cell body location, genetic identity, as well as its axonal projection target and look at downstream activity from these selected groups of neurons. And so taking a step back now and looking at this all from the bold functional MRI uh, perspective, there are a few limitations of bold functional MRI despite its popularity due to the fact that it allows us to study human brain non-invasively. Some of the limitations, main limitations include the ambiguity of the signal source, where the traditional sensory stimulation um, makes up for complicated activation pathways, making it difficult to tell which element triggered the signal. While the resting state fMRI uh, provides uh, interesting insights into the connectivity of the brain, it relies on correlation, uh, uh, not providing us with any causal information. Yeah, just a question. The implants are very uh, invasive. Implants. Yeah, the implants. The optical fiber the implants. Optical yes, fibers. yes. So how much do you interfere with, uh, first of all, with the cells themselves, with the healthiness of the cells and, mm -hmm. and their projections? And then on the behavior of the animals, because you want to do the yeah, correlation between these two. Things. That's a great question. Um, we try to make it as less invasive as possible, going through the shortest path, etc. But of course, it does damage a lot of tissue going in. It's uh, depending on where we, we're targeting. We're just going straight in from the skull into the area of uh, interest. Uh, that's one point of entry that gives us uh, some amount of destruction, but. Like I said, many neuroscience relies on putting in multiple wires in there, etc. And so you will have to be very careful depending on what system you're looking at in particular. But in the global scheme of things, um, our findings don't seem to be interrupted much from having this uh, uh, invasive probe. And also, we, we refine our surgeries very carefully to make sure the damage is limited to just the fiber going in instead of any additional damage. And it can occur if you don't do it right. So what's the recovery period between the implants, between the injection of the virus? I mean, you do uh -huh. a lot of manipulations on, on right. the same animal. Uh -huh. So how much time do you allow with the animal? We to normally recover? allow for at least a week of recovery time. <coughs> but around three, four days, it's, it's it seems, pretty good. It seems very short. Yeah, but in, in our case, we usually allow at least one week of recovery to make sure there's no problem. Since uh, at around three, four days, it sometimes has some blood uh, in the skull, etc. And so, yes. Any other questions? Um, okay, so again, the resting state provides correlation, non causal information, which also um, limits our interpretation of the signal source. While having this optogenetic fMRI approach, we completely eliminate a lot of these problems where we can specifically go into locations of each cell, select for its cell type, and look at its causal responses. 
However, on the other hand, uh, there is also an issue of image quality in functional MRI where there are large distortions in signal dropout and low spatial resolution problem due to the way the functional MRI uh, signal contrast is generated. And as a solution to that, uh, I propose using the passband balance SSF PF MRI approach. Where, for example, this is a human brain scan. If you scan a human brain uh, around the level of the sinus, uh, due to the auditory canal and the sinus, the air tissue interface creates a lot of these distortions uh, that makes it uh, difficult to make out any uh, activity in these regions. And the brain shape also gets distorted, making it difficult to register uh, different areas of the brain. However, using the passband balance SSP approach, you can maintain the oxygenation contrast that is used in fMRI to generate these contrasts while um, not having these distortions. And so uh, having these reduced distortions in signal dropout, we also get better voxel definition, giving effectively higher uh, spatial resolution. And so applying this passband balance SSFP OFMRI approach uh, to, the, uh, to the OFMRI approach, uh, we could also see that it allows more accurate monitoring of the global activity. On the left uh, here, you see the fluorescence image. This is a fluorescence image collected from uh, sacrificing the animal after the end of the experiment. And you can see that at the site of injection, you see fluorescence, and also at downstream um, axonal projection sites, uh, which shows the areas that are anatomically connected. And when we drive the subset of these uh, neurons, we expect to see some amount of activity at these sites that are directly anatomically connected. However, using the conventional fMRI uh, approach, we see very good signal in the motor cortex, while in these other areas, we see very spotty or no signal due to the fact that the underlying images that was used for the functional MRI acquisition was highly distorted. Um, using the passband uh, balance SSFP approach, we recover uh, most of the signal where we get nice signal in the motor cortex with uh, robust recovery of all of these um, activity in these uh, other regions. And also, if you look at the hemodynamic response function of the passband balance SSFP uh, OFMRI, you can see that uh, the, the um, hemodynamic response curve shape between the cortex and thalamus representing this uh, temporal firing pattern is maintained, uh, which is great. And now, going back to also uh, looking at how we can maximize the potential of this optogenetic functional fMRI approach, uh, we can think of a few things. One, uh, we looked at the distortion-free OFMRI. Uh, we want all the spatial localization of the neural activity to be accurate uh, without uh, misregistration due to distortions. We can achieve this with passband balance SSFP fMRI approach. On the other hand, we also want high spatial temporal resolution. It's very unlikely that using a functional MRI approach, you're going to resolve every single neuron at a single neuron level. However, it's very feasible, uh, possible, to think that you can resolve all the subnuclei and layer-specific activity across the whole brain. And for that, uh, we're using the approach of using uh, compressed sensing. And another important aspect of the optogenetic fMRI approach is that so far in fMRI, you are doing things like sensory stimulation, putting them in rest, which doesn't necessarily require that many uh, different parameter manipulation. However, now that you have this very specific control parameter where you can select for different cell types, you can select for temporal firing patterns, you can excite and inhibit inhibit them, you suddenly have many different parameters that you can control the brain through to sort through. And in order to efficiently sort through these parameters and analyze this brain circuit, uh, one of the things you would really like to have is this real-time uh, imaging capability where you would like to improve the throughput of the circuit visualization and control and also enable interactive stimulation parameter design. Just like when you're doing recordings, uh, electrophysiological recordings um, within the brain, you would like to have the ability to look at what the response of certain parameter is to select for your next parameter uh, that you want to look at. And so for that, uh, we utilize the parallel computation approach. And for this compressed sensing approach, uh, we utilize the fact that fMRI is a continuous acquisition of repeated um, 
3D volume acquisition. And so we do sub Nyquist acquisition and utilize uh, the um, sparse, sparsity of the data in order to reconstruct them. And also to have these uh, sub Nyquist sampling for MRI, this is a Nyquist sampled low resolution acquisition that we typically use while trying to traverse this frequency domain uh, really fast, while the undersampled high resolution acquisition system uh, undersamples the system while covering more of the high spatial frequency components. And with this design, what we can achieve is that uh, is high spatial resolution reconstruction with the compressed sensing giving approximately six times decrease in voxel volume in this particular case where this is a passband balance SSP acquisition um, raw fMRI image uh, overlaying the activity patterns where this is, um, you can see that due to the high fidelity reconstruction of the um, uh, passband balance SFP approach, you can get these uh, very nice non-distorted brain images with the activity pattern here. Moving down to uh, six times less voxel volume acquisition, reconstructed uh, using compressed sensing, you can get these very high resolution underlying fMRI image along with um, high resolution activity maps. Furthermore, for the real-time OFMRI acquisition approach, we use parallel calibration, reconstruction analysis, as well as motion correction and display where we made everything uh, in parallel with interactive control so that you can change different parameters of control while looking at the responses in real time uh, and have things like motion correction happen in real time so that you can uh, do these processes efficiently without the motion correction uh, without the parallel uh, representation just straight off implementing these algorithms we need about eight seconds in order to process all of these while with this parallel implementation we can now currently reconstruct everything in uh, 12 milliseconds which allows us to remove this uh, processing acquisition and processing stage as a bottleneck uh, of any of these uh, process and so having this I'd like to show you an example of our system. This is already about two years old, and so um, a lot of it is outdated in a sense, but this, oh. is playing. Oh, okay. So this is the cradle where we put in the Every time I use the laser pointer, it stops. I don't know why. OK, this is a system uh, where you can see the camera, which we designed to be MR compatible, is uh, looking at the animal. It's anesthetized with intubation. Uh, and you can see now we start to collect images in real time, where now we're doing the calibration stage of the acquisition, uh, we're reconstructing the images as the data comes in. And as the laser turns on and off, we go through a couple cycles to do statistical analysis uh, where we can start to see some activity here. Uh, this, is an, uh, this is a video showing uh, the approach of doing the statistical cyclic analysis. Uh, however, we can also do uh, different, uh, different processing in order to see uh, more uh, real-time changing dynamics. Uh, but here, uh, this is an approach showing where in this case now we can also average with the multiple run scans that occurred previously to get better uh, signal to noise ratio. And we can also, uh, we also have uh, software designed so that we could do interactive selection of ROI, looking at the temporal dynamic changes of all of these uh, signals, allowing us to truly have a real-time interactive system for these OFMRI studies. And the real-time motion correction built-in also improves our ability to look at these uh, signals in real-time. And having these real-time imaging, uh, image processing capability where all of our processing all combined together only takes 12 milliseconds, we can also do high temporal resolution reconstruction, uh, sliding the window with uh, not much difficulty. 
And just doing that, uh, we can also update information in much faster speed, which allows us to look, get these high temporal resolution information. The much debated initial dip characteristics of the fMRI uh, signal, we can see very robustly in many of the voxels. We're here by doing the 750 millisecond reconstruction, uh, we get these initial dips in the um, dip temporal characteristics that you can't see with the same data set reconstructed in three second temporal resolution, uh, which is an added bonus of using these real time approach. And so in conclusion, the optogenetic fMRI approach enables brain circuit visualization and control through element specific temporally precise stimulation and inhibition and non-invasive brain-wide response measurement with spatial temporal precision. We can look at all these spatial locations associated with it uh, while also getting uh, temporal uh, information. And the advanced OFMRI approaches uh, will allow OFMRI at its full potential with subnuclei, layer-specific resolution, and real-time imaging capabilities, and studies on brain circuits in awake behaving conditions. For example, one of our motivations to develop these uh, real-time um, processing capability is to aid some of these awake behaving uh, scans, which require much more robust imaging uh, schemes. And uh, OFMRI can integrate and synergize the understanding of normal and pathological neural circuits, where now we can start to dissect all the circuits uh, in normal as well as disease conditions uh, to look at these specific neural populations and how they uh, impact uh, uh, the whole brain. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my lab, uh, my collaborators, as well as my funding sources, and uh, I'd like to open for any questions. Thank you. Um, one of my lab's main interest is to look at these in various disease circuitry. And so we are currently investigating uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, epilepsy, uh, cognitive. How far are we from using these techniques in units? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> We are far in a sense that we don't really want to inject viruses into human beings. However, one of them... Yes, they are inactive viruses and there are a couple gene therapies going through successful clinical trials, which makes me think that yes, it is possible. Uh, and one of the obvious, uh, most immediate ways where this could go forward in humans is in therapies such as deep brain stimulation. We're not going to drill holes and put viruses and fibers into people for diagnostic purposes. Uh, but for cases where you have, um, you're drilling a hole, you're putting electrodes, these allow the possibility of having a much more specific control when you stimulate these neurons. And so uh, this will most definitely provide a much more um, accurate, more effective treatment uh, for these stimulations. And so in those cases, I believe that uh, it would be one of the fastest ways to translate it into human applications. I was going to say with the epileptic uh, patients, there is already a lot of uh, electrode-based stimulation, right? Parkinson's is the most uh, yeah. dominantly uh, DBS-treated field. Uh, epilepsy is also, uh, epilepsy has three different types of devices that are currently going through clinical trials in order to treat uh, uh, treat epilepsy. <laughs> and so yes, those are there are efforts to try and do this in depression. Uh, there are about five, six different diseases that I know of currently going through uh, clinical trials uh, in the efforts to treat with DBS stimulation. Yes. More questions? Okay, then. Thank you. Thank you.